<laughs> yeah. Um, All right, please go um, ahead, Zoe. I was also just going to add that, so though I'm doing my postdoc um, at Lanel, coincidentally, I'm actually in Sheffield at the moment, um, where much of the last research of the last talk was based, apparently, um, because thanks to the travel ban, I'm actually over here. But I am moving out to the US soon, which is very exciting. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the title of my talk is Variational Fast Forwarding NISC Simulations. Um, and really grateful for the invitation to present it to you here today. Um, and essentially, yeah, what I'm going to talk about are quantum algorithms to simulate quantum systems on noisy intermediate scale quantum hardware. Right, but briefly, first things first, um, why simulate quantum systems? Well, I probably hardly need to justify this to you. Um, it's valuable both for basic science, such as quantum chemistry and material science. And in the long run, may have technological applications in a diverse range of areas from things like pharmaceutical developments to catalyst design for carbon capture, or even developing room temperature superconductors um, for more efficient energy transmission. Okay, and why use a quantum computer to simulate quantum systems? Um, well, the problem with classical simulations of quantum systems, at least of highly entangled quantum systems, is that the size of the simulation grows exponentially with system size. So every time you want to simulate another system, that doubles the size of the Hilbert space and the size of the classical simulation. And this means that simulations quickly become intractable, even for moderately sized quantum systems. So to put some numbers on it, my eight terabyte laptop um, has the memory to run simulations for around um, 20 entangled spins. Um, I don't know whether you can hear my fans whirring away at the moment, but if you can, that's my laptop struggling at the moment to simulate, I think around eight um, spins. Um, and it's gonna be pushed up to around, I don't know, yeah, 30 spins, 30 qubits if you're feeling clever. Um, okay, and then the world's best supercomputers. Um, well, IBM and Google are currently fighting out as to whether the world's best supercomputer can be said to simulate 53 or 54 spins. Um, and whoever's right, the limit's probably not much more than 54 spins, um, at least for highly entangled systems. And anyway, performing such simulations would require a huge amount of time and energy and electricity and RPD bit of waste. Um, but for the technological applications <coughs> that I sort of mentioned on the previous slide, you're really going to need to do um, simulations around 100 or more spins, 100 more qubits. Um, and a classical computer is just not going to be able to handle that. Um, <clears throat> in contrast, um, the size of a quantum system, a quantum simulation of a quantum system, because a quantum computer is made up of quantum systems, only grows linearly with the size of the system to be studied. So you're going to be much better off using a quantum computer. Or in the more poetic but distinctly overquoted words of Richard Feynman, nature is in classical gamut. If you want to make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. Right. Okay. So, uh, specifically, so I'm going to introduce the variational fast forwarding algorithm, which is a quantum algorithm to simulate quantum systems. Um, specifically, um, a quantum algorithm for performing long term simulations on near term noisy quantum hardware. And this algorithm combines two pre-established techniques. The first is trotterization-based simulation, um, and the second is a variational quantum algorithm for compiling unit trees. So I'm going to start by introducing both of these in turn. Okay, so trotterization-based simulation. The idea here is that you start with the Hamiltonian for the system you're interested in simulating, and you approximate its short time evolution using a trotter expansion. So to first order, this amounts to just taking its exponential and dropping all the terms that result in non commutativity You can then simulate longer times by applying this initial trotter expansion iteratively. So if you want to simulate up to time t, where t equals n times delta t, the short time step, you just need to apply your initial gate sequence n times. So this is a sketch at the bottom here. You compute the short time trotter approximation, which is a set of gates, and then you just apply that set of gates repeatedly in order to simulate for longer and longer times. So trotterization based methods for simulation have been used both classically and quantum mechanically for many years. However, they have a number of limitations. So as I've already mentioned, 
Trollization, like all methods of quantum simulation, are limited on a classical computer by the exponential growth in the size of your simulation or system size. So you're going to want to do it on a quantum computer. But then, given the noise on current devices, um, basically gate infidelities are going to build up, and your state will start to be here. So there's only so many iterations you can apply before you hit the edge of the coherence time on your quantum computer, after which point your results will just be pretty rubbish. Um, so BFF, variational fast forwarding algorithm, aims to provide a way around this problem with using the iterated throttle approach on near-term quantum computers. Okay, so our proposed solution is to diagonalize the initial trust symmetry. So that is to write it in the form WDW dagger, where these W matrices are unitary rotation matrices in the eigenbasis of your trust unitary, and D is just a diagonal matrix which will contain six exponentiated eigenvalues. And then once you've got this diagonalization, there's no need to apply it iteratively. Rather, you can just do your fast forwarding by multiplying the angles of the diagonal matrix by n. That's because if you just do W, D, W, dagger at the N, that's equivalent to W, um, D, N, gamma, W, dagger. And this is sketched at the bottom of the slide here. So the resultant gate sequence doesn't scale with N, and so you can perform long time simulations within the coherence time of your quantum computer. Okay, but how can you diagonalize the cluster entry? Well, this is where the second pre-established technique comes in. It can be done using a variational quantum algorithm to compile unitary operations. So the key idea behind variational quantum algorithm, if you're not aware of them, is that only a small part of the algorithm is run on the quantum computer, um, typically an element which is hard to calculate classically, but relatively easy to compute on a quantum computer. And then the rest of the algorithm is run on the classical computer. And this is clearly less demanding on your noisy intermediate scale quantum computer. Okay, so these algorithms typically involve an optimization problem. So you run your favorite optimization algorithm on your classical computer. Um, so this could be gradient descent or Bayesian optimization or whatever your favorite optimization technique is, but with the cost function evaluated on your quantum computer. And by picking a cost function that is hard to calculate classically, but relatively easy to compute quantum mechanically, i.e. It can be done using short depth quantum circuits, um, you can, obtain a potential quantum advantage. So I use this term very loosely here, um, rigorously proving that variational quantum algorithms can be more powerful than classical quantum algorithms is notoriously difficult. Okay, so let me just spell out in a little bit more detail how these two ways work. Um, so we have an optimization loop of the type sketched on the slide here. So you tell the quantum computer to run some circuit, a parameterized quantum circuit, to evaluate a cost function with respect to a particular set of parameters, like rotation angles, typically. The quantum computer runs that circuit and spits out the cost function, performs a measurement at the end, and spits out the cost function for a particular set of parameters. It passes that cost function value onto the classical computer, which runs its optimization algorithm, and tells the quantum computer what parameters to try next. The quantum computer runs a new circuit with those parameters, spits out the new cost, sends it back to the classical computer, and you keep on looping around until you've minimized the cost function. And the parameters that minimize the cost will be, in some sense, a solution to your problem at hand. Okay, so to diagonalize a unit tree in this way, what you want to do is pick a cost such that the unit tree that minimizes it matches our target unit tree. So that's going to be our trotter unit tree, um, our short time approximation to the evolution of our system. And then you want to pick your parameterized quantum circuit in such a way so that it's always in a diagonal form. So then, when you minimize the cost, you're going to have a diagonal unit tree that matches the target unit tree. So you, you diagonalize that. Okay, so this can be done using the um, quantum assisted quantum compilation algorithm CRACK, and you'll sort of put out by Samit and others when he was at the Lano Sun School. Um, used to be with you guys. Um, and this algorithm works as follows. Okay, so our cost function for um, the quantum assisted quantum population algorithm, or quack, is the Hilbert Schmidt, is formed in terms of the Hilbert Schmidt in a product between a target unitary and your ansatz. So for us, our target unitary is just going to be 
when our arm of our charter unitary and our ansatz will be a matrix in a diagonal form. So that is the form W E W dagger would be a diagonal matrix. Okay. Um, and crucially, this cost function is faithful. So it equals zero if and only if um, our ansatz equals our target. So the if statement is certain E V C. So if U equals V, then U dagger V equals our identity, trace of identity is D. We've got one minus D squared over D squared equals zero. And more generally, if U does not equal V, then the inner product is going to be less than D, and so the cost will be greater than zero. Okay. More generally, the cost function is also operationally meaningful for non-zero values because it can be related to the average fidelity between U and V. So the average fidelity here is defined as the fidelity between a state acted on by B and a state acted on by U, averaged over all possible states according to the Hal measure. And we have this relationship between the average fidelity and the cost, which tells us that the smaller the cost function, the higher the average fidelity. So you know if you've got a small cost, U and V match well. Okay, and crucially, um, this cost can also be measured using a short depth problem circuit. Um, I'm not going to show you how now, but I do have some bonus slides on that if you do want to see the gritty details. Okay, well, that's the cost. And then what our aim is to do is to just find the, we use the diagonal ansatz, and our aim is to just find the optimum angles, theta op and gamma op, that minimize our cost. Um, and when we do, so that's done using this hybrid quantum classical optimization loop. And when we found those optimal angles, we will have a diagonal matrix that well approximates our property unitary. Okay, quick technical caveat here. Um, I introduced the Hilbert Schmidt test cost on the previous page because its form is reasonably straightforward to understand. However, it's not quite the cost we actually advocate using for real implementations. Um, so a downside of the Hilbert Schmidt test cost is its landscape can become very flat um, for larger problem sizes. Um, this is known as the bound plateau. Um, you can imagine if the cost landscape becomes very, very flat, it becomes hard to find its minimum, i.e. it becomes hard to do the training. So to avoid this problem, um, we instead use a cost called the local Hilbert Schmidt test cost, um, which is sort of a local version of the global Hilbert Schmidt test cost, um, which is crucially easier to train. Um, so I'm not going to really go into precise details about its form, but in essence, it's constructed from a sum of entanglement fidelities. Um, it can also be measured again using a short depth straightforward quantum circuit. Um, but crucially, it's bounded by the standard Hilbert Schmidt test cost. And this means that it inherits the faithfulness and the operational meaning that the Hilbert Schmidt test cost has. Um, so it's faithful and operational meaning, but easier to train. Okay, so that's a technical caveat. Not too important to follow if you didn't follow it. Right, okay, and this is a summary of the algorithm. So you have your input Hamiltonian for the system you want to simulate. You start by taking its trotter by doing a trot approximation of this Hamiltonian to approximate its short term evolution. You then diagonalize this trot approximation using quack, which is a variational quantum algorithm for quantum compilation. So that is, you use a hybrid quantum classical optimization loop with the cost function evaluated on the quantum computer, and then gradient sent for whatever your favorite optimization algorithm is used to minimize this cost. Once you've minimized this cost, you will have a unitary in a diagonal form that well approximates your initial trotter unitary. And you can use this unitary to perform your fast forwarded simulation. So that is, you have a constant depth circuit, which just by multiplying the optimum angles of the diagonal matrix by N, you can use to simulate a longer time slope. So you can simulate the Hamiltonian H at the time T, where T equals N delta T, just using W, D, W dagger with the angles of the diagonal matrix. Okay, so that's the algorithm in a nutshell. Um, the one thing that's important to highlight is that the variational fast forwarding algorithm is an algorithm for approximate simulation. So there are errors introduced both by the initial trotter approximation and from the fact that when you learn your diagonalization using your variational quantum algorithm, you're not going to learn, um, your diagonalization is not going to perfectly match the trotting entry. Um, both because you're only going to run your optimization algorithm for so long, and also because your quantum computer will be noisy. Okay. 
And what we can do is we can show that the total error for the simulation after n time steps is always going to be less than or equal to the sum of these two errors, the totalization error and the machine learning error. Okay. So just to be a bit more precise, the simulation error here is defined as the difference between the exact unit tree, um, so evolution under Hamiltonian H for time n delta p, and the final unit tree you use for your simulation, so that is W D W dagger with the input the gamma matrix multiplied by n. And the difference here is just measured by your favorite Chapman genome. Okay, trotterization error is just the difference between the exact simulation. Um, and the initial trotter approximation. And the machine learning error is the difference between your initial trotter approximation and the diagonalization you find. Okay. Um, so this inequality we have here is, I guess in a way it's, it's, it's honest, but it's also reassuring. So yes, there are errors, um, but they don't blow up exponentially under fast forwarding, they just scale linearly. Um, okay. That's the first thing we did in terms of simulation error analysis. The second thing is we can use this bound um, with a bit of manipulation to derive a termination condition for BFF. Won't go into the detail, it's just algebra, but essentially the termination condition tells us that given, it tells us the cost we need to achieve during the optimization stage in order to guarantee a particular final simulation reality. Um, and I guess in the exact form doesn't matter. What's important is we do we did manage to calculate the threshold cost we've got to get to to achieve a certain simulation fidelity, um, which really makes our algorithm well defined because it tells you how long we need to run for. Okay, so that's a simulation error analysis. Um, here's some numerics showing that the algorithm actually works. Um, so we simulated the XY spin chain. Um, so here the ZIs and XIs are just Z. So ZI is a Z. Pauli operator on the ike qubit. The xi is an ike, um, x Pauli operator on the ike qubit. J and B are just parameters. Um, and the data I show you here is for a five qubit simulation. So this is a noisy simulation on a classical computer. Um, so on the left here, we've got the cost as it's iteratively minimized. And on the right, um, we plot the fidelity as a function of time um, for a noisy simulation using BFF. And what you can see that is that if we get the cost pretty low, so down to 10 to the minus three, then we can achieve a simulation fidelity of above 0.8 for over 100 time steps. In contrast, if we were to try and do the simulation just with the standard iterated trotter approach, um, well, that does substantially worse. So before even, after only a handful of time steps, I think around seven or eight here, the fidelity of the iterated trotter simulation is already dropped below 0.8. Okay, that looks promising. Um, sorry, uh, this is Mark. Can you clarify again, if you, I'm sorry if you already did it, um, VFF1 through VFF4, what are the indices? Okay. So this is, okay, we, we, we minimize our cost and these little dots here just show so basically correspond to different points at which you could stop the optimization. And then what you do is you take the parameters um, corresponding to that cost value and then do the fast forwarding. So when you take the parameters corresponding to a cost of only a bit below 10 to minus one, the fast forwarding is pretty poor. Um, the simulation fidel of the, the fidelity of the simulation drops off rapidly. But if you take the parameters, once you've minimized your cost down to below 10 to the minus three, and then you do your fast forwarding, you do your fast forward simulation. Now the fidelity remains approximately constant. The simulation is much better. Thanks. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. And then we do exactly the same down here. Well, okay, similar down here, but this is now on real hardware. So on IBM's quantum computer. So on the left is the cost as it is iteratively minimized. So the raw cost are basically the cost function values that we get actually spat out by the quantum computer. And this noiseless one shown in green is if we take the parameters corresponding, so we take the parameters we've got from the quantum computer at each step, but then classically compute the cost, that's what we show in green. So it's a corresponding noiseless cost. Um, so the green line is really showing you how well you're actually doing. And you can see that we're doing pretty well. We're basically getting the cost approximately down to, I think it's around 10 to minus two, 10 to minus three. 
So we, we do this fast forward, we, we do this, um, we iteratively minimize the cost, and then we take the parameters. This time we just take the parameters at the end. So after the 16th iteration, sort of corresponding to the lowest cost function value, and then we do our fast forward simulation. And the, that's what's shown in yellow here. So the fast forward simulation um, on the quantum computer is above 0.8, has a fidelity of above 0.8 now for around 20 times gaps. Um, not as good as the classical simulation, but still a lot better than the iterated trotter simulation. So we also did the iterated trotter simulation on the quantum computer, and that performed incredibly poorly. So after only two time steps, it's already got a fidelity of below 0.8. Okay, so this is really evidence that using BFF, you can substantially outperform the iterated trotter method on um, noisy hardware. Okay, right, so that was variational fast forwarding. Um, and I'm only gonna go through this in brief, but we've also proposed a number of refinements. So the first one is the variational Hamiltonian galvanization algorithm. Um, so this, here we directly, okay, so in um, VFF, you diagonalize a trotter approximation of the um, Hamiltonian. And that induces a trotter error. Um, and the trotter error carries through to the final simulation, as I showed you in the simulation error analysis. Um, so in variational Hamiltonian diagonalization, to avoid this, we directly diagonalize the Hamiltonian rather than initial the trotter approximation. So this gets rid of the trotter error, making the final simulation more accurate. Um, but this increased accuracy has a cost, and the algorithm is more resource intensive to run. Okay. And then we have the variational fast forwarding. Oh, and then we have fixed state variational fast forwarding. So once you have a diagonalization in BFF, you can use that to fast forward any particular initial state. So you can use it to look at the long time simulation of any particular initial state. Um, but often for physical applications, we're only interested in simulating a particular initial state. Um, in which case it's an overkill to have a diagonalization that works for all possible initial states. So the fixed state variational fast forwarding algorithm is tailored to this less exacting but commonly encountered task. Um, and the resulting algorithm is less resource intensive, so it's yet more suitable for near term hardware. Um, I had a lot of fun working on this last summer with my former students, um, Joe and Caitlin. Okay, and for all of these algorithms, um, we provide a rigorous analysis of final simulation errors of the algorithms, as well as proof local versions of the cost and proof that these local versions are trendable. Um, as well as doing, of course, proof of principle implementations on noisy simulations and then hardware. Okay. Um, so, in a nutshell, the algorithms that I've described to you consist of two steps. So, the first step is to diagonalize the short time evolution unit tree or Hamilton in, in the case of BFF or diagonalize the short time evolution. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, first step is to either is to perform a diagonalization. In the case of BFF, this is diagonalizing the short time unit tree evolution. In the case of BHD, which I only flashed up briefly, it's a diagonalizer Hamiltonian. Um, and we do this diagonalization using a variational hybrid quantum classical algorithm. Um, and then the second step is once we've got this diagonalization, we can use it to fast forward the simulation, um, that is perform a long time simulation with a short depth circuit, um, just by multiplying the angles of the diagonal matrix by n. Um, so this is sketch on the right here. And this really opens up the possibility of long time simulations um, beyond the coherence time of missed devices, because now instead of having a simulation that grows with time, we have a fixed depth circuit that can be used to simulate arbitrary time. Okay, I think that's everything I had to say. So, does anyone have any questions? All right, thank you for a nice talk. Um, Gerard, I saw raise his hand. Would you like to go ahead, Gerard? Uh, yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, well, first, thank you, Zoe, uh, for the nice talk. Um, I, I have to say it was a bit of a surprise hearing uh, another British person at one of these seminars. But, uh, I just had that <laughs> same reaction. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I, one of the things I was really struck by looking at these variational algorithms is they, they remind me a lot of um, quantum, quantum optimal control. 
And I was wondering if there's anything you could comment on uh, regarding that. Um, my main comment is there's not enough communication between the two communities. Um, so there, there are a lot of parallels written in different languages. And I think a lot of the time people working on various recorded amalgams are reinventing the wheel when some of these things have been considered by um, people working on optimum quantum control before. Um, but there are now, there is now a growing awareness of the links. Um, and so, for example, people are now using sort of Lie algebra results from optimal control theory to, to help pick the right ansatz. So, say you're trying to compile a unitary and you need to pick a gate sequence that is going to grow in a certain way. How can you pick it to ensure that? that gate sequence will actually contain your target unitary. And there's all sorts of ideas in quantum control theory you can use there. Um, but if you want more precise comments, uh, you might have to sort of yeah, pin down your question a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's good. Um, thank you. Uh, and yeah. Uh... All right, any other questions for Zoe? I have some peculiar questions. Um, so you talked about a way to measure the error and you talked about different p-norms, but if you're comparing unitaries, isn't it kind of the case the only relevant one is the infinity norm? Um, so not for our analysis. So let me, yeah. So, okay, that's why we left it in terms of generic p-norms because oh. um, the trotter error is typically described using the infinity norm. But the machine learning error here, well, it's hard to measure Schatten p-norms on a quantum computer. So you're best off using the two norm. And oh. you're best off using the two norm because then the Hilbert-Schmidt distance can actually be measured. And actually that's how we, this arrow um, involves using the Schatten, using the two norm for the machine learning error and relating that machine learning error to our cost function. And that's, then you basically replace the machine learning error, the cost function, rearrange, and this gives you the threshold cost we need. So not just the infinity norm, the two norms are also relevant here. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a way to approximate infinity norm as an overlap, right? Anyway. Um, I, there might yeah. be, but I guess it's, our cost function is already directly related to the two norm. And mm -hmm. we want to know what cost function we need to achieve in order to have a certain final stimulation fidelity less than a certain amount. I see. That's, that's interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to have your answer for that. So Gerard mentioned connections between variational algorithms and control theory. And so I'm curious a bit more about that. Has the, and you know, I'm kind of new, uh, to, I, I don't really know much about either. But um, this issue of barren plateaus, it's now quite famous in variational algorithms. Has that issue arisen in the context of control theory before? Yes. So when I first presented this talk, um, someone in the audience put their hand up and they had an optimal control background and said that people have been discussing this in optimal control theory for years and you should look at um, their research. And much to my shame, I didn't actually go away and explore that. Well, I printed out some papers and they sat on my desk for a while. Okay. Um, the other place that, so in classical machine learning, this is known as the vanishing gradient problem. Mm -hmm. And the vanishing gradient problem is slightly different because I came, the bound plateau phenomena is the variance in the gradient vanished exponentially with the problem size, so the number of qubits. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's related to the fact that the Hilbert space grows exponentially. Whereas the vanishing gradient problem in classical machine learning is not related to the size of your problem. It's not, um, it's related to the depth of your ansatz effectively. So the depth of your neural network. Um, so it, it's a different phenomena. Nonetheless, um, some of the tricks they use to resolve the problem there may well be transferable to um, the quantum regime. So for example, correlating parameters has proven successful there, and people have now looked at correlating parameters around that in the quantum case, and that, again, um, helps here. But I think there were really obvious, more work needs to be done on this, and I, people are actively looking into this, basically, to what extent we can take tricks they use there and apply them here. OK. 
Okay. Gerard, do you have any comments about barren plateaus in the context of control, quantum control theory? Sorry. Uh, well, from my perspective, I've, 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 normally, uh, I've normally been doing tracking control, which uh, I think it avoid, avoids the problem of having to kind of, you know, search a landscape. But the, the trade-off with that is that you end up with kind of the possibility of singularities in your track. So I think, I think um, it's, it's uh, <laughs> uh, they're, they're kind of related problems. I, I think that you can, get, you can get to a space where, you know, uh, essentially your algorithm doesn't know what to do. Um, so yeah, I think I, th I think it's just um, it it's it's part of the kind of uh, intrinsic nature of a control problem, actually. No matter how you approach it. Great. All right. Well, I'm I'm glad to learn more about this. So I think we're we hit the time. Let's let's thank um, both both Zishin and jo Zoe for you know uh, enlightening us about two different research domains. And um, I guess that's a benefit, a benefit, the bright side of the Delta variant is that, you know, rather than having it locally, we could have some uh, interesting remote talks.